Secure 2.0 isn't the game changer. It's easy, you bring in the tax advisor, that expands your footprint. And I'm gonna give you the magic words. You know, you're opening Gambit. If rates go up, the Roth Advantage soars. It's just an opening. Secure Act was a game changer. The greatest money-making asset any individual can possess is time. All right, well, welcome to another round table discussion here at our event. Uh, this is our mastermind here, and, and these folks here have separated themselves from everybody here amongst the 2,000 people we have here. They, they've separated themselves amongst the group. So they've got questions for you uh, concerning your book, retirement planning, IRAs, and annuities. So we're going to fire away with a question. You have 90 seconds to answer. Oh, no. Okay, okay. here we go. Uh, so, what do okay. call that, the, the lightning round? Lightning round, that's correct, that's right. That's thank correct. you for being with us. Answers 3.2, next. <laughs> 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 My name is Andrew, and as an insurance advisor, what would you recommend? How do I carry the conversation if I want to help a client convert from an IRA to a Roth? Because I'm not a tax specialist. How do I walk them through it, that It's easy. You bring in the tax advisor. That expands your footprint. You know, for years, I had advisors like you, insurance, uh, financial advisors. They always wanted to have lunch with me. You know, I never had lunch, <laughs> and I never met with them unless they said the magic words. And I'm going to give you the magic words. If they said, we have a mutual client. I still never had lunch with them, but I sat down and did the, did the work. But I said, we have a mutual client. You know, I want to help that client. Every CPA wants to help their client. You're going to need them in things like Roth conversions, how to get the, the funds out at the lowest rate. Remember, I talked about always paying taxes at the lowest rate. They're going to be a key player. And if you show that you want to help them preserve more of their money and show how important the tax planning is, that's going to get you in the door. At least I think so. Not the, the lunches and all that other stuff. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. I have a question. That's what I figured. That's why we were yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 How, how lightning was that? That was yeah, good. No, right. <laughs> Thank you so much for the value you're providing. But um, 2.0 um, of the tax code where the government's like reuniting people with their old 401ks right now. How would you suggest uh, us to speak to our clients to make sure we utilize that the correct way? It's just an opening. Uh, Secure 2.0 isn't the game changer that Secure was. Secure Act was a game changer. It was transformative. You know, it changed all the plans our clients had. The stretch IRA, now they have the 10-year rule. Very complicated to get the money out, especially for the next generation beneficiaries. Now Secure 2.0 has a few, you know, has like 90 provisions, but nothing earth shattering, but it's an opening. You know, you're opening Gambit to say, you know, yeah, they had new laws because they don't really know about it. They only see the headlines. They say, oh, 2.0. That's why I say go out and talk to them, start a conversation and see what could apply to you. But the big thing, like I said in there, is to let them know, look at the size of their IRA. What's your plan? If your plan is to have this last as long as possible for you and beyond beneficiaries, this plan's probably not going to work. It'll get decimated by taxes. I can help you do that by moving from forever taxed, I always like to say, to never tax, tax deferred to tax free, to get rid of the tax risk. I think it's the biggest risk, and most people are loaded with IRAs and 401ks and don't know they're sitting on that ticking tax time bomb. Awesome. I'll take the next question. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Your humor is so fun. I love it. <laughs> it's only good if you take, uh, uh, take action. <laughs> Uh, the best advice I gave you there was the last line for next week. Yeah. Which one? See, you didn't catch the last line. Oh. <laughs> Valentine's Day. 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 That's true. Oh, that's so don't get the $89 state. Yeah, yeah. I saw that only because I saw it at a restaurant last week. Uh, they have they post the Valentine's Day. The same steak is like $50 more now. That's true. <laughs> it's wild. All right. Uh, so, so that's it. That's all you needed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to run with it. Um, so my question would be for a lot of Gen Zers, the younger uh, guys, how would you start your conversation with them taking from like just an IRA to actually utilizing life insurance for their exponential part? Like what would be a... Well, there would be two ways, uh, uh, several ways. There's so much you can do with young people. The greatest money-making asset any individual can possess is time. And young people have more of it. They waste a lot, but they have more of it than anybody else. You can help them capitalize in several ways. First of all, no young person uh, should be doing IRAs. Anybody starting out should only be doing Roth, Roth 401ks at work, building up tax-free. Imagine if we could have had our whole account be tax-free from day one. We wouldn't have to spend all this money converting. Plus, they're probably in their early career stages, so they're probably not at large tax rates, and rates are low anyway. Whatever IRAs or 401ks they have, they should be converting and start building tax-free. They're also 
able to lock in insurance because they're young, they're generally healthier, and they might have a, more of an in with you to talk to their parents about it. You can have an in with them, I should say. You know, you get the conversation started. Young people also want the same things. They just don't have any money. <laughs> uh, it's true, but if you can get them started even a little at a time, building a Roth tax-free, and then get them to talk to their parents, because their parents are the ones that maybe they think they're going to inherit all this, but if they're going to get loaded with taxes, that's probably not a good plan. So you can really get to both generations. Okay, cool. So it's kind of a spinoff of that question. So ever since the, the transition from defined benefit to defined contribution, yeah. there's been a lot of changes in the retirement landscape of how we prepare for it, but the advice and the philosophies of what we do hasn't really changed. What advice are we still utilizing today and what advice is still being given out that you think is the most dangerous to the next generation of retirees that are starting to save right now? Well, the worst thing to do is fall into the trap that we went into because that was the only option, IRAs and 401ks. They're useless. All you're doing is building a debt, but people are short-sighted. They say, but if I do the 401k, I get a tax deduction. Tax deductions are meaningless. You pay for it later on. You know, you have to tell people, if they take a tax deduction for either an IRA contribution or a 401k contribution, that's just a loan they took from the government that has to be paid back and then some at the worst possible time in retirement when rates will be higher, when the paychecks stop. You can stop that now and get them straight on and look for better alternatives from the get-go, like I talked about, anything tax-free. I'm a big believer, as you know, Roth IRAs, not for every client, but every client should have the conversation. You should have the conversation with every client to get into tax-free territory, to eliminate tax risk, and even the life insurance of the annuities to eliminate market risk. That's going to be a big problem. It seems to be a scam coming out all the time. You know, people want stability. They want trust. These, these things, especially life insurance, it's something people can rely on for life. They want stability, certainty. Uh, life insurance tends to be unaffected. I think it's because a lot of Congress has that. You can rely on it. I did it myself. And what I told you in the program, do it for yourself, too, because it makes you can't even imagine the way you will change your demeanor, the, your approach, how you will be talking, just like I did up there. Well, that's what I did for myself. Oh, I won't do it anymore. <laughs> no, I, I, we'll keep it going. That is so critical to get the trust and the believability, the credibility. It just comes across so different when you say, this is what I did for my own mother. This is what I did for my family. you got to believe in what you sell, and then the sky's the limit. Oh. Hey, and I got a question. Uh, what do you say to the people that says, hey, I got my 401k, and they're matching, you know, dollar for dollar, 10%. They can I'm match to Roth 401k, too. There are new changes in Secure 2.0. Matches can go now to, uh, starting, I believe, next year, can go to the Roth 401k. You can still get the match. You never will turn away free money, that's for sure. But now, this is uh, one of those areas we talked about, Secure 2.0, where the match can actually go to the Roth side. Actually, Congress wants the match to go to the Roth side because it's a revenue raiser for them. I have a question there. Yeah. Um, we talked about being able to save taxes on 401k. What about maybe getting to like a, a 1099 uh, age, maybe somebody that's you know, board of retirement and wants to do something. Is there a way that you can see taxes by? Yeah, uh, anybody with it, when you say 1099, self-employed, a, mm -hmm. a gig worker, whatever you want to call it, right? They have their own little business. Some people call it a Schedule C, sole proprietorship, or their own little corporation, their own business. Mm -hmm. They can have retirement plans there. But again, I'm a big believer in the Roth. And the reason I keep hitting on the Roth is because I believe at some point, I just look at the math, like I said, at some point, rates are going to go up. If rates go up, the Roth advantage soars. If rates go up and you're sitting there with even a SEP or a simple anything tax deferred, that bill is going to come due later in retirement when you want them to have more money, more access, and less worry about future tax rates. That's why I said in the program, always look at the end in mind. You know, it may cost some money now. Yes, you won't get tax deductions, but look at what you'll have later when it's going to mean the most. I have a question. You know, um, if you were to select between a Roth and a life insurance for somebody starting out for retirement, what would you recommend? All right. The question is, because I can't, I can't look. He's behind me. So the question is Roth or life insurance. Now, right. personally, I have them both because they both serve different purposes. But the thing they have in common, you're building tax-free. 
So life insurance may not be for everybody. Ross may not be for everybody, but we know what's for nobody, anything taxable. Why would you grow a taxable tree? So uh, because everything is going to be taxed that we don't even know what future rates are, but they could be prohibitive. So the Roth, it might be easier to get money into that. It's easier to access money. Life insurance, Maybe you, you start building a little at a time. I started with a smaller cash value policy and built up over time. But they're both great planning vehicles. Everything depends on the facts and circumstances for each client. This adds to your value because it's customized. You're not giving them, remember I talked about the guy in Starbucks, they're just saying the same thing to everybody. As a matter of fact, I just had that a couple of weeks ago. This is, you could, uh, <laughs> I come into a restaurant, uh, like a steakhouse, it was in San Diego, a nice uh, steakhouse, but I'm by myself like I usually am. So they don't even listen, and it's fancy steakhouse, all right. So then the guy comes with a menu, the maitre d' or whatever. I just told him, it's just me. And he says, okay, uh, are we celebrating anything special tonight? I said, who, you and me? <laughs> they don't even listen. You know, that's what, it, it's gotta be special for the client. So it's good they have questions because the more things you can do that are customized to them, they know they have a special plan. And I have a question. So when it comes down to the current economy, we got $31 trillion of debt. The, no politician basically wants to throw a campaign saying, if you vote for me, I'll pay, I'll increase taxes. It's not a popular campaign. No. Um, and expecting $40 trillion of debt by 2030s. What, oh, they've what, already solved that problem. I don't know if you saw last week. They want to issue a trillion dollar coin. Oh, really? <laughs> you see that in the paper no, last week? I yeah. It. I mean, what if you lost it? Fell down the drain or something? <laughs> a trillion dollar coin. You know, uh, I, I, that, that's, 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 is that a solution? Right? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not. There's no solution. But, it's just something that was floated last week and for years anyway. So they're, they're not expecting a great reset, reset expecting a great depression. So what is, in your opinion, the only way that we're going to be able to avoid that? Or if not, how to... Well, I don't that. believe taxes are going to go down. I don't even know if they'll go up because exactly you said, you know, after 25, they're supposed to go up by law. With all these low rates we're talking about end after 25. But I don't think any politician on either side is going to sign something for higher taxes. Mm -hmm. just not popular. So what does that mean? All right. So they keep the taxes low. That means, again, less revenue, more debt. At some point, like I said, the credit card's got to come due. So you, again, you got to position yourself in uh, getting away from worrying about future tax rates. And the only way to do it is having your money grow tax free in more solid investments. And I always come back to life insurance. I, that's where I have my own. I have the cash value going up. You never have to worry about tax rates. In fact, uh, when tax rates do go up, and I got to believe at some point they will, anything tax-free like Roth IRAs and life insurance become immediately more valuable. And clients that I have, you know, nobody likes paying for anything up front, but that's why you say, I said you have to give them the long-term big picture. What do they get at the end of the game? That's why I talked about yep. that uh, gone with the wind, begin with the end in mind. How are we going to get there? Larger inheritances, more control, less tax. Then they're not as focused as on what does it cost to get me there because they want to get there. You don't have to answer this, this uh, person, but I'm always very curious. I've been watching your, uh, your video for a long time. With your wealth of knowledge, why is it that you never thought about getting your insurance license? Oh, that's a good question. No, you could ask. You, you want to, that's okay. Why did I never get my insurance license? I've always been a tax advisor, a CPA, and over the years, you make a great point. I've had almost every insurance company come to me, offer me all this money. If you just you know, get licensed, you know, we can make a, we'll pay you a for, I never wanted to do that because it would kill every show on public television, which I've been doing 15 years. I get up there and I say, I'm independent, objective, unbiased. It leads to much more credibility. I've always found that has helped me throughout my whole career that they're getting this advice from somebody who doesn't sell it. For example, even in my book here, I call life insurance, if I can find the chapter, if you look at the, uh, the name of the chapter, I gave life insurance, insure it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I use uh, this quote from Henny Youngman. I love this guy, because it's a good short quote. So I've got all the money I'll ever need if I die by four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I call it the power of life insurance, because I think it's so powerful. So I never went that way, because it always served me to say to groups, and I do a lot of consumer and client programs, and even when I do it for advisors like you, 
much more business gets closed than when I do it, than when you do it. Because I say, well, he sells the product. With me, I'm saying, no, this is what I did for my own family. This is the way to have more, keep more, make it last. Larger inheritances, more control, less tax. So that's why, but that's a good question. People ask me that all the time. Why didn't, and I'm, I'm telling you, you would be sick if you, if I told you, I'm not gonna tell you, how much money I turned down from almost every insurance company. <laughs> And I have a question for you. I'm over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I meet with a lot of parents that want to save for their kids, and I think it's sort of synonymous with college planning. And But I also have a lot of parents that will say, but my kids are little. I don't know where they're going to be. I don't know if they're going to want to go to college. For parents that want to save and they want to do things right with the taxes, but they are ultimately looking for control and a lot of options depending on what their kids need, what would be some of your recommendations? To open Roth IRAs for the kids. I, I was never a big believer in the 529 plans for exactly the reason you said. You open them when the kid is born. How do you know if they're gonna get, a, right. get to college? As a matter of fact, I just came across somebody who had done the 529 from the time the kid was born, and uh, then he tells me now he's got two, 300,000 in there, mm -hmm. and the damn kid got a scholarship. Now what do I do? Right. <laughs> right. Now he's got this problem because if it's not used for education, then you could have a tax problem, a penalty even. You're much better off saving in a Roth. Now, you can't save for every kid in a Roth because they have to have actual job, but you could save in your own Roth or convert your own IRA to a Roth and pull from there. Once you have the Roth IRA five years and 59 and a half, which most parents might have, by the time the kid's college age, you could pull from there if you need it absolutely tax-free. You could use it for anything, but it makes a great education funding vehicle if you need it. You can also make gifts, unlimited. Most parents don't know this. If they have money, they can make direct gifts, unlimited amounts if to unlimited number of people if they're made directly to the college, the university, or for medical or, uni or hospital bills unlimited direct gifts. And I find a lot of parents and grandparents love this. They don't like giving younger kids money because they're always worried they're going to squander it and blow it on the next crypto thing or whatever. <laughs> they love this provision because they know they have to make the gift directly to the college. They have to pay the tuition. It's not a gift. Pay the tuition directly to the college. They know their gift is going for the intended purpose and they love that. Beautiful. My name is Sergio for... Uh here, everybody, we, we become a 1099 the moment, the moment we get our license. At what point will you recommend switching from just a Schedule Z to a corporation to C corporation? At what income level will you start switching? Around? It's not an income level. I would say it's more a growth level. If you start taking on employees and yeah, you need health insurance and this and benefits and everything, you know, you could still do that as a Schedule C, but as you grow, I started as a Schedule C and I eventually went to an LLC because you want liability protection. You're building a group, uh, a company with employees. So it's more, I guess they're tied together because as you grow, probably your income, but there's no number. I think it's just a general growth. What's, what size and from... I don't know if it's a number. You you can have sole proprietors. Uh, you can have authors of things that do everything themselves and they make millions, you know. But if you're in a in a business that you need a lot of people to make it happen, whether it's uh, office, administrative people, other salespeople under you, then you're building an organization like a lot of people have here. Then you should probably have some kind of LLC or corporation just for your own protection. Thank you. Are we missing anybody? Goodbye. Does it work the same way in reference to what you said? With I, I didn't catch the beginning. What's the safe way you said? No, does it work the same way when it comes to gifts? If it's the child, well, not the child, but the adult children giving gifts to the to their parents? Yeah, you, anybody can give gifts to anybody. You know, gifting is a great thing. You just have to know the rules. And this goes for everything I talked about. You still have to know what you're doing, but you can know enough to get the conversation started and always bring in other professionals to get, you know, the bottom line is to do what's right and best for the client. You'll always profit from that and, and get the trust from that. But go to the, uh, I forgot the other part of your, because you had said about the tax benefit when it's... Uh, oh, can you gift the other way? Yes. Yeah, uh, you can gift a child. Most people don't do it because it's like reverse estate planning. <laughs> you know, you want it. Usually wealth goes from the you know grandparents to the parents to the kids, not up the ladder. 
but I guess if you want to help somebody, sure, you can make gifts. You can make uh, annual exclusion gifts for 2023. Anybody can give anybody 17000 for free once a year. And then you have the unlimited gifts for tuition and medical, like I talked about. And then if you have really wealthy people, I mean, anybody can use up the exemption. The Right now for 23, it's 12920000 a person. So uh, there's a lot you can do with gifting. And for high net worth people, that's the only ones who would do gifting because basically they have too much in their name. The gift is great because the gift removes the asset from their estate. It removes the income it was throwing off from their estate. It removes the appreciation from their estate. And best of all, it's tax free to the recipient. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. Very good.